I want to say to you that this Connie Mack Day is a great day for baseball. Well, Paul, I want to tell you that if our club was well up in the race, that I'd feel uh, very much better today. Well, this tribute to you and to baseball is no more than you deserve, sir, but I'd like to ask a favor. May I have your lucky scorecard after the ball game? Well, Paul, I'll tell you to be frank, I'd like to give you that card, but I'd much prefer to give it to you when our club wins another pennant. Welcome to the Daily Rewind, brought to you by ThisDayInBaseball.com. My name is Tom Hannon, and I'm your host. On today's show is baseball's grand old gentleman himself, Connie Mack. On February 8, 1956, one of baseball's most prominent figures, Connie Mack, dies at the age of 93. He was known as the Tall Tactician, and he was baseball's grand old gentleman for more than a generation. Stately and slim, he clutched a rolled-up scorecard as he sat or stood ramrod straight in the dugout, attired in a business suit rather than a uniform, a derby or bowler in place of a baseball cap. He carried himself with quiet dignity and commanded the respect of friend and foe. After his 11-year career as a journeyman catcher in managing Pittsburgh's National League, he became a prominent figure in Ben Johnson's Western League. He was a founder in the American League in 1901, and Mack managed and owned the Philadelphia A's from 1901 to 1950. He led the team to five World Series titles and nine American League pennants. He set records for wins as a manager with 3,731 and losses at 3,948. He compiled a 48% winning percentage as a manager during his 54 years. And he actually won election into the Hall of Fame in 1937 while he was still an active manager. Now today, we're going to have an interview with Connie Mack that was conducted by the legendary Joe Cook on his Shell Chateau radio broadcast on May 29, 1937, in which Mack picks his all-time all-star team and discusses his, his rivalry with New York Giants manager John McGraw. Let's hear from Connie Mack himself. Now, if you will just move in a little closer, everybody, I'd like to point out some of the brighter stars that are out tonight. You see that tall one? Well, that's the grand old man of baseball, Connie Mack of the Philadelphia Athletics. There's a funny thing about baseball. You read in the newspapers about Joe Hoosett, the veteran pitcher, and you figure Joe must be an old fellow with a beard who has to roll the ball up to the plate. Then you take a look at the records and find Joe is still in his 30s, and that's the way it goes. When a man stays in baseball for more than 10 years, they hang flags on him every Memorial Day. Tonight, I want you to meet a man who contradicts all this, the super veteran of the game, a man who was winning pennants before most of today's players were born. And here he is, Cornelius McGillicuddy, known to all baseball fans as the great Connie Mack. Thank you, Thank you. Connie, uh, just to keep this thing straight, how long have you been active in baseball? Uh, this is my 54th season, Joe. Uh, 54 years, uh, only a temporary job, huh? <laughs> well, I guess it must be your favorite game. It's more than that. Baseball has been my whole life. And I wouldn't know what to do if I wasn't in the harness. And you look you... mighty young for a man who's been wearing harness all these years. <laughs> Thanks you for must the... have started the game playing in rompers. Thanks for the compliment, Joe. But I wasn't one of those infant prodigies. A prodigy. I was a raw rookie when I broke in. But I was wearing long pants. <laughs> well, what were you in the beginning, Connie? A pitcher? No, I was a catcher. But not a very good one. In 1895, I decided I'd rather be a manager. It's easier to tell the other fellow what to do. <laughs> well, when did you win your first pennant, Connie? In 1902. And did you win the World Series that year? There were no World Series at that time. The first World Series was in 1905, between the New York Giants and ourselves. They had a young Irishman for manager named John McGraw and a pitcher named Christy Madison. The combination was too much for us, and we lost four games to one. 
Well, when did you get another chance at John McGraw and those giants? Not until 1911. And then we turned the tables. We had taken the world's championship from the Chicago Cubs in 1910, and we repeated again against the Giants in 1911. Two in succession. Well, as we say back home, you really took your World Series seriously, didn't you? Yes, but we cooled off too soon. That was an odd thing, Joe. In 1912, I had what I still think was the best team I ever managed. Yet I lost the American League pennant that year and won the next year in 1913 with a team that was 20% less efficient. That spoiled my chances to win four pennants in a row. Well, did any manager ever win four in a row? Yes, John McGraw did, from 1921 through to 1924. Well, I can see that John McGraw's path crossed yours many times. I'd have missed a lot if our paths hadn't crossed, for he was a fine man. I met him first when he was playing third base for the famous Baltimore Orioles back in the 1890s. That was a great team, and he was the leading spirit behind it. I've heard some tall tales about those Orioles. They must have been some birds. I class them as one of the best teams in the history of baseball. What about that team you had with the million-dollar infield? You're spending too much money, Joe. It was really called the $100,000 infield. Well, I was only $900,000 off. Not bad for a fellow who still counts on his fingers. That was a great team, all right. I had to break it up in 1915, and for a very strange reason. During the last years of our winning streak, attendance kept falling off. The fans just got tired of watching us win. I had to sell the boys because I couldn't afford to pay them what they were worth. And you had to begin all over again. Yes, I started building from the bottom, and I didn't win another pennant until 1929. Then I took three in a row. I saw that team in action. Grove, Earnshaw, Fox, Dyke, Simmons. Uh, how long did you keep that outfit together? I began to break them up in 1932. Once again, it was hard, but I had to do it. Every man was a star, and the budget of our club couldn't pay their salaries. And again, I had to start from scratch and build a complete new team. And from the looks of things, you're on your way to the top again. So your athletics have been playing a nice brand of ball this year. I have some splendid youngsters on the team now. They're full of fight and full of promise, and I'm hoping for the best. Of course, the Yankees look strong for us this year, but there's always next year. So how many pennants have you won altogether, Connie? I have won nine, Joe. One more, and I would equal the record that John McGraw created. Under him, the Giants took ten pennants in the National League. Well, you've seen them all in your time, Connie. Would you name an all-time, all-star team for us? I'd be glad to do it, Joe. All right. Now, who would you put on first base? George Sisler of the St. Louis Browns. Uh, second base? Uh, Eddie Collins of my 1910 Athletics. Uh, shortstop? Connor Wagner, the Flying Dutchman of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Third base? Jimmy Collins of the Boston Red Sox. Uh, what about your outfield? There I'd place a combination unbeatable for power and skill. Babe Ruth, Ty Cobb, and Chris Speaker. Now, what would be the pitching staff on this all-time team? Two right-handers, Christy Matheson and Walter Johnson, and two left-handers, Rue Bordell and Lefty Grove. And who would be your catcher? Another player who was once one of my boys. He's been making a game fight this week, not on the field, but in a hospital, and my prayers and the prayers of all Americans have been with him. For catcher, Mickey Cochran, manager of the Detroit Tigers. Now, we'll... We'll see him catch again, Connie. He has the strength and the courage to come back. Uh, by the way, who would you pick for the all-star manager? There's only one possible choice. John McGraw. I'm happy to hear you say that, Connie. And there's someone else here tonight who must be happy about it, too. And here she is, Mrs. John McGraw. <laughs> Good evening, Mrs. McGraw. I suppose you and Mr. McGillicuddy have met before. Yes, and he's not Mr. McGillicuddy to me. He's Connie Mack. It's good to see you again, Connie. And it's good to see you, Blanche. I believe this is the first time since the All-Star Game of 1933 out in Chicago. Yes, it is. And I was rooting against you that day. Did you see that game, Mr. Cook? No, I missed that one. But you know, John and I were good friends, and he told me all about it later, which was just as good as seeing it. It was John's last year. He had retired but they asked him to lead the National All-Stars. 
Connie Mack led the American League stars. It was like old times again, watching them try to outguess each other. Joan did a wonderful job that day. He directed every play, called for every pitch. And yet we lost. It was no fault of John's. Babe Ruth broke up that game with a home run, Joe. And no man could tell what the babe would hit. <laughs> yes, the babe would hit almost anything but old ladies and little children. Well, well, Joe, after the game, John said if he had to lose at all, he was glad it was to Connie. Yes, John and I went through the wars together. We were always on opposite sides. Sometimes he won, sometimes I won. He liked to win as any man should. He had a spirit that hated to accept defeat, but he always made it a clean, honest fight. He was a real sportsman and a credit to the game of baseball. Thank you, Connie. I spoke about John's record tonight, his 10 National League pennants. I'm still trying to equal it. And I wish you luck, Connie. Of course, I would like to think John had left a record that would always stand, something for which he and no one else would be remembered. But, well, I wish you luck, sincerely. That's because you're a sportsman, just as he was. Do you know one reason I'm so anxious to tie that record? No, Connie, what is it? Not just for the glory. I'd like to feel that in the future, people would think of us together. Think of us as one, John McGraw and Connie Mack. I'd like to think that we were in the same league. It makes me proud to hear you say that, Connie. Thank you again. And thank you both for coming here tonight. Thank you, Joe. All right. How about that all-time team from 1937? Who would be on yours? I'd love to hear from you. Check us out on thisdayinbaseball.com and let me know who your all-time team would be. I was a little surprised even at that time you didn't take Garrick at first personally, but, you know, that's just me. You can find this clip on YouTube. You can check out the channel by R-R-A-Q-U-E-L-L-O on the YouTube. And if you enjoyed listening to Connie Mack, you can find out much more about Connie Mack on ThisDayInBaseball.com. We have over 100,000 pages about specific events on ThisDayInBaseball.com, and Connie Mack is featured on quite a few of them. So as we wrap things up here, I'm just going to ask you for two quick things. One, please tell a friend about the show. It is the number one way that we grow. The way that podcasts grow, 70% of their growth actually comes from people sharing a show or telling a friend. So if you enjoyed it, please share it. And please don't forget to subscribe so you can get our content the minute it comes out. And secondly, you can help us by sponsoring a page on thisdayinbaseball.com. You could sponsor Connie Mack's page. You could sponsor February 8th. Maybe today's your birthday. Today could be the day that you sponsor a page and share your favorite stories on thisdayinbaseball.com. So check us out, thisdayinbaseball.com slash page sponsor, and see if there's an event that you'd like to sponsor. That's it for today's show. I'm out till next time. I hope to see you at the ballpark. Peace. Peace.